AviationPros.com is the portal website for AMT, airport business, and ground support worldwide magazines. Visit daily for breaking news, industry blogs, and insightful articles from our magazine's editorial team. And don't forget to sign up for our publication's daily e-newsletters. It's all at AviationPros.com. Welcome to this edition of the Aviation Pros Podcast. I'm Josh Smith, editor of Ground Support Worldwide, and today we're speaking with Ron Dutt, CEO at Flux Power, to get a better understanding of various battery chemistries and how those batteries can have an impact on the electric ground support equipment market. So, Ron, I want to thank you for joining us and sharing your expertise on this topic. Thanks, Josh. Uh, glad to be with you today. Very good. Uh, we're we're Thrilled to have you, and I'd like to start our conversation uh, by giving our listeners a general understanding of uh, the batteries themselves and the various chemistries that can be used in the EGSE space. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the two most common types of battery chemistry found in EGSE are lead acid and lithium ion batteries. So can we start there and just get a better understanding of how these types of batteries and any other battery chemistries that might be out there, you know, differ in terms of how they're used, their energy output, charging methods, maintenance requirements, kind of things of that nature. Sure. Yeah. You, you've kind of opened up Pandora's box a little bit in a, in a way, but it's very uh, timely, very relevant. I think everybody uh is is now getting somewhat conversant or at least interested in in battery cells since uh, the wave of electrification in this country looks like it's going to be unabated and grow dramatically but to you know to start off uh, the a uh, lot of the electrification has been lead acid lead acid's been around since 1913 and made made improvements uh, for, for many, many years. And, and you see the, the latest efforts. I think lead acid batteries will always have a place just like alkaline batteries with a particular use. However, lithium has come into its own in terms of being economically viable over, over the past, I don't know, 20 years initially with uh, lithium batteries in your in your cell phones and laptops, you know, a real small format. And a lot of those formats have the chemistry of cobalt in them, which provides very energy dense capability for, you know, very, very small space. Now, uh, energy density also means potential requiring thermal management. Otherwise, you can have thermal runaway or you could have explosions. I mean, witness the hoverboards that people have seen videos of exploding or or the tesla cars that has some ther- some thermal events however the level of development and sophistication of applications of those high high density chemistries has been really been very successful in thermally managing those cases so uh, along comes uh, lithium in, in, in areas such as material handling and the airport ground support equipment. Over the past, uh, call it seven, eight years, uh, developing its bidding cards. Tesla had the certainly uh, preceded that somewhat, uh, popularizing the use in the, in the automobiles. And that Tesla chose the uh, cylindrical format, which looks like a large AA battery, and they made even larger AA batteries that get grouped together and modulized in the, in the underbelly of the car. In material handling, we have much more space to work with and with ground support equipment as well, kind of lumped in that, that general area. Of, of space, so we can work with a prismatic form, which looks like a bulk. Uh, each cell looks kind of like a, a smaller bulk, and they're grouped together, modularized in a, in a package. And the benefit of that, from a material handling standpoint, there are fewer cells uh, to manage and deal with for logistics. So that's a plus in in this environment as, as well. So we, we've introduced those over over uh, over the past eight years. And uh, the real benefit from our standpoint uh, in material handling and GSE is that we can provide 
cells that last longer, have a longer life because of the lithium chemistry versus lead acid. You don't have to water them every two weeks, uh, which is a logistic issue. Even if there's some automated watering, there's still, it's something that in large facilities or large operations, people don't want to uh, take the time. And so that limits the life of the packs. It gets into the economics. The other thing is if you have a round the clock operation with lithium, you can plug it in at breaks and lunch and continue to charge it. So you don't have to ch change out batteries. So those economics really provide a lower, what I call a product life cycle cost. All of the companies that, that we sell uh, lithium to are looking at a, a lower cost and 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 doing and doing more work and and lithium provides that but that's also in view of the fact that the initial price is probably two and a half to three times that of lead acid but because of all those cost advantages over the life it represents a life cycle cost so if it's an operation where somebody doesn't use the equipment very much well maybe they stick with lead acid and the lead acid requires a lot more maintenance a change out a shorter life so there's a lot more handling that goes with that so the last thing i'd say on this uh just to, to put this in, in in proper dimension is that people are aware of fuel cell operations and uh uh, and there's that was introduced, I don't know, 20 years ago, and the material handling companies looked at it. And uh, the fuel cells make a lot of sense in certain applications, possibly trucks, other industrial applications. In the material handling and even GSC, it, it was of interest because uh, round the clock operations, you could charge your batteries in 10 minutes or less. However, there's a big capital cost to that, and uh, uh, it's certainly only uh, practical in greenfield applications and um, where you have large-scale greenfield new applications to put that equipment in. So it's out there, but in, in our business and in, in, the, in, the, in the wider applications, material handling and GSE, the lithium applications are the one that's uh, uh, meet the economic criteria and performance criteria the best. Expanding on the uh, the lithium side of uh, this topic, uh, as I understand it, Flux Power utilizes a specific chemistry uh, called uh, lithium iron phosphate. And I guess I, I'd like to get a sense for how that lithium iron phosphate uh, chemistry differs from other uh, lithium-based battery chemistries. What makes that stand apart from from others? It, it's a it's a great question because uh, with the the world of the laptops and the cell phones and the Teslas, it requires a much higher energy density. So the the the, the, the chemistries typically have of of cobalt and some other elements in there that provide that lithium iron phosphate doesn't have cobalt. It's not as doesn't require the thermal management. So for example, in in China, uh, the Chinese government. Uh, does not permit use, uh, will permit only use of lithium iron phosphate and not any cobalt version on all their buses because there's a concern about thermal management. Also, when we look at the uh, entities that track all of the uh, sales and applications, there's over the past last couple of years, there's been an increase in the mix of lithium iron phosphate versus anything with cobalt in it, because they're seeing that, you know, this thermal management issue is somewhat of a, con uh, a concern. It's also cheaper. N not having to use cobalt is a precious metal and uh, lithium iron phosphate is provides a more economical uh, source of uh, energy for that. And also without the, the management now, Across the world, what's interesting because of this electrification wave I talked about earlier, which is really sweeping the, uh, the the market, there are a number of other chemistries that people will read about that are being developed, such as a lithium sodium version, a lithium solid state version, vanadium, titanium, and so forth. So the good news is for all of us, we're, we're agnostic as to what the um, chemistry is, but the development 
of of new chemistries is going to is going to benefit all all of uh, us consumers and and businesses and companies to get that next incremental increment of efficiency at a lower cost. So, but but currently the mix of lithium iron phosphate, which is what we use, a lot of the people in our industry sector use, is on the rise, on the increase uh, for the reasons I mentioned. Excellent. Oh, this has been a, a great overview to get the conversation started. Uh, why don't we take just a quick break here, uh, but when we'll come back, we'll have a little bit more with Flux Power's Ron Dutt. Would you like to reach key decision makers in the industry? Share your message on the Aviation Pros podcast and reach key leaders across all facets of aviation, including aircraft maintenance, airports, FBOs, airlines, and ground handling. Contact one of Aviation Pros' helpful account representatives to find out more. We're back with Flux Power's Ron Dutt, and now that we've gotten a chance to discuss the different types of EGSE batteries in the marketplace, I'd like to learn a little bit more about how Flux Power has incorporated the lithium iron phosphate chemistry into its G2 series platform. So Ron, Flux Power recently completed UL Solutions compliance testing, uh, and that allows the company to obtain third-party certification uh, for this new battery technology. Um, I, how long has Flux been working on this battery chemistry and, and this technology platform? We started our, our effort on that back in 2015, and we assessed the market and realized that uh, we wanted third-party validation of these lithium cells because there was a lot of uncertainty, number one. Number two, we were, it was early days we were developing. We actually wanted the certification to ensure that we were meeting the highest standards for our customers uh, and the UL certification provided that because it was focused primarily on two main areas, safety and durability of, of the cells. And so all the constituents are very concerned about that. So the third party uh, ran our, 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 our battery cells and packs through a whole series, whole panel, of testing for thermal management, shake, vibe, drop tests, durability, safety tests, which which really gave all of us uh, the satisfaction that um, these these cells would perform the way we wanted to. So we made that decision in night in 2015, and our first packs, our smaller packs of material handling, achieved that UL certification. So we've worked with the UL entity for the UL certification on all, all the packs as we continue to roll out larger and larger packs to get those UL certified. And we just completed our latest round with our new platform, which included this G2 uh, offering uh, for the um, airport ground support equipment sector. And we're very pleased with that. Uh, that it met those certifications, and it also represented the result of all of our experience and learning of the GSE application since 2015 uh, to modularize, to create this pack that has as few parts as possible uh, to make it the most economical and high-performing source of power for the tugs, the pushbacks, and the other GSE equipment. As you're going through the uh, the process uh, for UL certification, um, you know, what what is required of the battery manufacturer, and um, you know what steps you need to take to make sure that uh, you're you're meeting these standards that you're you know seeking to accomplish. Well, you know, it really started back in 2015, which we 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 worked with the UL entities and what's involved. How do we make these cells pass the test? What are the real requirements of of um, what temperatures uh, do they need to operate at, uh, under uh, the durability uh, uh, and so forth? So working with UL over the years, we actually developed all of the testing requirements in-house. Initially, we had to go to third-party testing facilities to meet those requirements. And uh, we realized that um, we could do that ourselves, given that the UL would have have oversight and testing sign off. So we built that credibility with UL uh, that we have the in-house experience and, and, and capability with their sign off, of course, 
to achieve that. So I, I would point out that all of our packs are designed to meet you well. Um, I, I would put a footnote on, on the ones we're releasing now. They may not have that certification stamped on them, but we plan to get that stamped on them, but they're all designed to uh, have gone through those UL certification steps. You mentioned, you know, achieving that credibility, demonstrating you have the capabilities to, um, you know, put these uh, batteries out into the marketplace. Uh, those seem like very obvious uh, benefits for achieving that certification, but are there are there additional um, benefits for going through this process? Yeah, I think, you know, we and our customers are, you know, want to be sure that these packs will last uh, and we have, uh, we'll meet our warranty requirements and expectations with our customers from uh, five to 10 years, depending on on what the parts are. Some of the electronic parts uh, have a shorter life, but the cell's going up to 10 years because the, the equipment uh, can last that long. And we want to get good al alignment with the life and performance of the battery cells with the with the with the ground support trucks and how long they're going to last and also good alignment with the duty cycles uh the the duty cycles uh of the gsc equipment are typically not constant but they they do have some different profiles and we want to align these battery packs with the life of the equipment and also with such equipment as pushback trucks which require a large amount of energy discharged to push that plane back, and uh, uh, but it's not constant. So you want solution that provides that is economically attractive to do to meet those short-term performance requirements and also have a long life to it. So all this testing and all this experience over the past uh, almost 10 years now has gone toward understanding those nuances, including the temperature of the environment. Uh, we test packed our packs in Minneapolis in the winter to ensure that the heating elements of our pack will support leaving those packs outdoors on the tarmac through the, the Minneapolis uh, um, uh, winter. And also uh, more recently, when the hurricanes ran through Florida, uh, not too long ago, that created a very high stress environment of water invasion in the packs. And and as, as you would suspect, anything that's electrical or electrification is sensitive to, to shorting out if exposed to water. So there were a number of things we learned through, through, through that uh, experience as well, which can benefit all the airlines and uh, airport uh, support groups that these packs can deal with all of those uh, different in environmental situations. You've mentioned uh, pushback tractors specifically and some other motorized equipment, but I'm curious what range of uh, EGSE uh, units can these battery packs be applied to? Well, it, it, typically most of the equipment is 80 volts. So all of our packs have 80 volt voltage to them and ranging in, in amperage from 200 amps to 400 amps, 600 amps, 800 amps uh, that, 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 that we can provide those higher, higher kilowatt uh, applications. Um, we also have done projects up to 400 volts. So for um, any kind of uh, other applications requiring even more power, we have uh, the capability to do those high voltage applications. And what you're seeing, again, with the uh, wave of electrification is uh, heretofore different equipment that was using diesel or internal combustion to, to operate vehicles that are now migrating to lithium in those high voltage situations because we now have the experience and have vetted the uh, use and also the economics you know in these these commercial industrial application the economics it always come down to the economics says can, can can i save money and and it doesn't work and so we see now uh, a migration to those he heavier applications or the more uh energy demanding uh applications using this so and in the more recent one was of course the pushback but uh also uh, many other applications as well 
you mentioned earlier that the battery packs have some um, modular components built into the uh, the system. And I, I, if I understand right, that allows for these uh, different voltage ranges and capacity requirements. I guess, can you just uh, expand a little bit on how that modular concept uh, helps you expand this product line or the, um, the range of uh, equipment that these battery packs can be used? Yeah, modularization is really important, and, I, and it's really in two primary categories. One is the electronics. So uh, we've designed an electronics tray. So if there's anything that issues happen with the electronics, uh, which could be the battery management system, the circuit boards, the capacitors, the uh, contactors, you just take that tray out and put a new tray in because in, in the world we're talking about, the worst thing that can happen is the is the uh, downtime with the equipment because the battery packs will have an issue. And uh, so you want to ha- shorten downtime is a very, very high priority. So if you modulize these components, you're not having to send someone in and troubleshoot, well, exactly what went wrong with that circuit board or take that circuit board out and, and put a new one in. Uh, so that's an important concept in this environment. That, that's to the benefit of our consumers. The other category modularization is with the cells. We use these individual cells that look like a small book, and you and you um, uh, for whatever application you're using and how many amps and and voltage you'll want to modularize them so that uh, you can handle and connect these modules together. So we may have four to eight to 16 modules, which could could make up anywhere from 96 of these particular cells to 144 of these cells. And uh, we're actually now automating the the uh, putting together and connecting the, the cells together to operate so that if you have a problem, you take one of those modules, which could be four cells, eight cells, 12 cells, 16 cells that are bound up together and connected uh, with, with, with bus bars and uh, replace those. So again, so you can service any issues that might come up with the pack quickly because you want to have as little downtime as possible. So it's a very important consideration. Ron, this has been a very informative conversation. I really appreciate this uh, broad overview of what can be a very complex um, kind of sector of our industry. Um, So I really do appreciate that insight. But that's going to conclude this episode of the Aviation Pros podcast. Again, we'd like to thank our guest, Ron Dutt. And if you'd like to learn more about flux power and EGSE battery technology, you can visit www.fluxpower.com. And to stay up to date on improved ground handling operations, the latest technology in the ground support space, and related aviation topics, subscribe to Ground Support Worldwide's daily newsletter. And as always, please continue to visit AviationPros.com.